Uh, there we go. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Google Hangout event, Genre Bending Thrillers. My name is Ellen Wright. I'm the publicist at Orbit. I am joined here by three great authors of thrillers that bend genres uh, with fantasy, and also with our moderator, Amal El Motar, who is an acclaimed author of short fiction as well as a reviewer for NPR Books. Uh, our three authors today are Jay Wells, who is the author of Dirty Magic, Melinda Lowe, author of Adaptation and Inheritance, and Michael Mar Marshall, author of We Are Here. We are going to be taking live questions during this Hangout today. Uh, you will find, if you're watching us on Google+, there is an interface on the right of your screen where you can put in your live questions. We'll also be taking questions at the Orbit and Mulholland Twitter accounts. The Orbit account is Orbit Books, and the Mulholland one is Mulholland Books, so those are pretty easy. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Amal. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, welcome to all of you. This is tremendously exciting to me. Um, I really, really enjoyed all your work, so I'm to get to actually ask you some So I thought before, um, before actually delving into stuff that you're all doing in your books, since we are talking about genre thrillers, I thought it would probably be politic to begin by all being on the same page, as it were, as to what a thriller actually is. Uh, because it occurred to me, as I was sort of preparing for this, that I think we're probably lumping a lot of things under a thriller umbrella. And I'm really used to doing this in discussions of science fiction and fantasy and asking what is science fiction and what is fantasy. And I'm delighted to skip over that question um, and instead ask each of you guys, um, what is a thriller as far as you're concerned? Like, is it something that you know when you see it? Is it a marketing category as far as you're concerned? Or is it something else? Actually, and to just kind of lead us with that, I wanted to say, um, according to Neil Stevenson quoting Bruce Sterling, uh, a thriller is a science fiction novel that involves the President of the United States. So, you know, you can, <laughs> you can agree or disagree with that or just, yeah, leap in with um, what you think a thriller is. Who wants to go first? I guess I will since I spoke. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I'm not a thriller writer. I'm a fantasy author. Uh, mostly by trade, so I would hate to try and give an official definition. I set out to write crime fiction, um, which I guess uh, falls under, one of them falls under the umbrella of the other. Uh, crime fiction is a story about crime, and um, that's pretty much the definition. A thriller, though, when I think of them, is um, involves a ticking clock of some sort, um, high stakes, um, a lot of running, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> Thrilling. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with what Jay said, and I think that's so funny, that definition that you read, um, Amal, because um, I, I feel like with adaptation, I set out to write a science fiction novel with a president involved, <laughs> kind of on the side. I mean, not as a major character, but um, I, I agree there's a clock ticking. It should be thrilling, and I think there should be a mystery involved. I do feel like most thrillers are have some kind of mystery um, at the center of, their, of the story. Good. Hello. Uh, yeah, sorry, I just explained that apparently I'm causing static on the whole system, so if I seem a bit distant sometimes it's because I'm muting myself and then no, unmuting myself and then being muted. <laughs> uh, if they start muting me while I'm actually talking, then I'll start to take offense, but otherwise. Um, thriller, I don't know, it's a tricky one. Um, thriller seems to me one of those sort of genres which is, it's it's quite an anemic definition. I mean, people know what they mean by mystery, people know what they mean by fantasy, they know what they mean by science fiction, but um, thriller, I guess... It's tricky, and I, I sort of, I sort of think that all books should have a degree of thriller in them. I think, and I think, being a thriller involves suspense. It involves driving the reader forward from the end of one chapter into the next chapter. It involves some degree of, of huge emotional and 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 visceral engagement. And I'd like, I like to see that kind of thing in virtually any book, to be honest. Uh, and I think thriller is often used in a rather dismissive fashion. The kind of um, <clears throat> to cover the kind of books that you know salesmen in suits buy in regional airports to tide them over short um, airplane journeys, and I think it's a great shame because I think a, a great deal of interesting stuff can be done with, within the thriller. Um, I think it's a it's a it's a pot into which you can put a great deal of different genres, different types of material, different types of observation, and um, 
I think it's it's maybe one of those the genre that, that that's in need of strengthening and a bit more love. To be honest. Hmm. That's really interesting. So, thank you very much for that. Actually, it's I, I like the I like the term an anemic definition. That's that's really good as well. Um, so. Given all of those views, then, on what constitutes a thriller, and given that the books that um, that we're going to talk about today partake of elements of those, can I ask you, then, when you're writing, how aware are you of thriller as a genre category or of something that you just want your story to partake of? I mean, do you sit down and you say to yourself that you want to write a thriller, or do you decide on the story that you want to tell and then find that the elements that might be marked as thriller later are coming into it sort of their own accord. We may as well just keep going in that same order, I think, Jay, Melinda, oh. Michael. Um, when I sat down to write Dirty Magic, um, I had one goal. Well, I had a kind of a pitch in my head, which was that I wanted to write The Wire with Wizards. Um, I'm a great fan of the show um, and cop shows in general, and I thought, you know, and because I tend to write fantasy, I always want to put magic or demons or something into a mundane world. So I thought, well, how would that story change if it wasn't about drugs? What would it be if uh, magic was the uh, commodity uh, that was causing people to kill each other and do all sorts of horrible, greedy things uh, as humans can sometimes do? Um, that said, even though that was my goal, really the only thing that I knew it needed was cops. Um, so I set out to write a cop story with magic. So I didn't, I was aware that there were certain conventions in a police procedural and in crime fiction, um, but because I was adding the fantastical element to it, I didn't feel bound to those because blending genres allows you to bend the rules. And so I was aware that there were conventions, but I didn't feel bound to them. Um, I agree. When I when I started writing adaptation, I wasn't uh, I didn't feel bound to any thriller conventions either. I think it helps that I am um, adaptation and inheritance are both um, young adult novels, and in YA, there's YA is basically all about genre bending. So I feel like that's kind of where it starts and I, I knew that there would be sci-fi elements, I knew that there would be mystery elements, I knew there would be romance elements and so um, I wanted to bring those out in a way in the book that made sense for the story. I, I definitely did not sit down thinking I have to fulfill certain conventions. Um, I think that that can be very limiting for a, a book and a writer. I think it's, it's, it's definitely important to maintain focus on the story you're telling and how to do it the best way. Yeah, I think Melinda's right. I mean, I, I have a, a proven track record for being absolutely lousy at sticking to any kind of genre definition anyway. I've started out writing <laughs> horror, and then I wrote science fiction, and then I wrote, I guess, serial killer mystery novels, um, and now write something somewhere in between most of those things. Um, I think I think it depends to a degree on, on why you're doing what you're doing and who you're trying to pitch it toward. Um, there are some people who are very, very keen on one particular genre. They, they, they'll walk into a bookstore and they're only ever going to go to the science fiction section or they're only ever going to walk to the mystery section. And if that's the case, then you do need to stick to certain genre boundaries because certain readers can be very put off by things that move outside what they believe that they want to read. Um, I'd like to believe there's a, there's a lot of people out there who really just want to read a story and some characters and want to see some ideas and are comfortable with the way in which those things are manifested being basically secondary to the ideas. I, 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 I never said, that, okay, I'm going to write a mystery um, because I don't think that's important. That's a meta tag. just seems to be counterproductive. It's hard enough to write a good book without being worried about that kind of thing as well. Unmute myself. Yes, absolutely right. Um, this is great, actually. You guys are all talking in, in roles and being you know, so orderly about this, and I'm just nodding along and, and getting to say, <laughs> that's fantastic. Um, I really do actually want to comment on all of the things that you're individually saying, but um, I'm beginning to get uh, notes about questions that people are, are asking as we're doing this. So I think probably that engagement will come a little bit later. So forgive me if it's a little bit 
feeling like roach right now. Um, this is just uh, the beginning. But um, I really liked uh, what you were saying, Jay, about uh, about the about cop shows and liking The Wire and everything. I saw that you loved The Wire from the material at the back of Dirty Magic and was super excited because I only discovered The Wire recently and was absolutely blown away by it and mainlined like all five seasons in an embarrassingly small amount of time. <laughs> uh, but um, I want this brings me to my next question, which is um, how do you consume your thrillers? Uh, like, do you guys find that you actually, you know, watch more uh, media that might be called thrillers, or do you tend to read it more, or uh, is there some other way in which you consume it? And if so, um, do you find that the way in which you consume it has a different influence on your writing? Uh, for instance, like, do you find that cop shows have a different influence uh, than you know, reading other mystery novels or reading crime fiction, or does it all kind of tend to, set, to fall into the same place? Um, so it's, it's a bit two questions kind of muddled into one, but if you'd like to talk a bit about, you know, where you get your thrillers uh, that you yourselves enjoy, that'd be really great. Do you want the same order, or do you want to give somebody else a chance to go first? <laughs> well, unless, unless like, you know, somebody else wants to jump in, um, that's totally fine. It's, it's great for me just because if we're muting microphones as we do this, it's good for me to kind of know where the, the conversation's at. Yeah. Um, okay, well, I, uh, I mean, I've already mentioned that I love cop shows. Um, of course, last night we just had the thrilling finale of True Detective, which... Um, no was, spoilers. I'm, I'm not going to say what happened, but, I mean, <laughs> people obviously really love that show, just like they loved uh, The Wire and um, Dexter and uh, Breaking Bad. People are fascinated by crime, and TV is doing a really wonderful job of writing crime stories right now. Um, that's it. I mean, I don't only watch TV. I'm a writer. I love to read. So, um, you know, I do have some favorite authors like I love Tana French, um, kind of on a different end of the spectrum. I love Janet Ivanovich, Janet Ivanovich's stories, um, uh, J.D. Robb. There's, there's lots of really wonderful books, too. Um, I set out when I wrote Dirty Magic because I was influenced by a cop show. I wanted to take the things that I loved about a cop show and put them into a book. Um, and combine them with uh, magic. Um, and I think if you read the book, it um, it is visual because I wanted it to be visual. I wanted you to see it as if it could be a cop show. Um, and of course, writing for a visual medium is really different than writing books. There's a lot of things you can get away with in a book. You can tell a lot of information that has to be shown in a TV show. Um, so it's a little bit more of a challenge in that regard. Um, so I think that that's one difference when you're using one source material over the other. But um, I think they're all great. They're all really fun stories that um, there's a reason that it continues to be a perennial favorite. Thrillers are never really out of vogue. Like Michael said, they show up in every genre. Mm -hmm. um, people love to be excited and root for the good guy and, you know, hope that, you know, see how they're going to outsmart the villain. And they're just great stories. Yeah, I'm a I'm a Tana French fan too. I, I love her her crime novels. I read a lot of uh, crime fiction. I think I just a couple weeks ago I just read Michael Connelly's latest. I I've really enjoyed his his books. Um, and um, I also read this book that called The Martian, which was really like how everything can go wrong on Mars as an astronaut. <laughs> it was it was really it was very thrilling. I have to say it was it was a fun read for like science geeks. And um, but I, I the thing is when I'm writing though I cannot read other fiction because it um, this is something that has happened recently so I find that it kind of seeps into my own writing so I try to avoid reading fiction while I'm um, while I'm working on my own stuff uh, at least in the first draft or in very in, um, intensive scenes so I do like to watch a lot of uh, TV too I just finished the um, Five episode is very brief season of The Fall, which is a uh, crime show set in Belfast, starring Gillian Anderson. It's brilliant. It's just a really wonderful um, serial killer mystery that has a lot of thriller elements. It kind of moves a little more slowly than, well, than like something like 24, <laughs> but it's uh, very well done, and I found that to be really interesting. So yeah, 
I like I like thriller elements in all sorts of reading, so and and television and movies. Yeah, that's interesting. It's interesting you say there about thriller elements. And I, 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 have I be, I'm not muted at the moment. Can people hear me? Can you hear me? Mm-hmm. Excellent. I'll try and say something worth while. Uh, years ago, I went to my favorite mentions that I went to called um, Noir Festival. It was, it was in um, Italy, in uh, Comayo. And what was interesting to me there was that it was basically focusing on noir, which is, to be, able, to be honest, if, if, if I'm going to be labeled, it's a label I'm far more comfortable with than thriller, because again, I think noir is a flavor that you can add to version in the type of genre. And what was interesting about this convention was that they had science fiction, they had horror, they had crime, they had what kind of thriller, they had some dark fantasy, all of which, whilst being within their chosen label genres, also had these elements of noir. And I think maybe that's Maybe that's another way of looking at thriller, not just between different um, prose or, or books, but also within TV, movie, um, and, and books as well. And I think also what you said about speed, I think maybe speed is something that we look for in thriller, that sense of something driving forward. Um, but I, again, I don't even know whether that's essential. I think you can have a slow play. I, mean, I think it's quite a... If it's a slow thriller, does it become suspense? suspense. I mean, as you, as you can tell, they keep talking and talking and talking about actions and anything worth listening to. These sort of genre definitions, getting tied up on genre definitions, saying, is it this, is it that? I don't really care. You know, and I think it's often very, very hard to to mark things down like that. And it's you've also almost got to ask why. Um, you know, why, why do you need something put in the box office? Like why is it easy just to say it's fiction or non fiction? And telling you know, like that, it's, it's not, never something I've got to protect. Right. This is um. Wait, did I unmute myself? Yes, I did. Okay. Um. So that's that's a, that's a really good point, and I'm 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 really interested in these questions of where um where the boundaries are between what we call a genre, what we call a flavor, what we call a subgenre, for that matter, and um and these hierarchical categories, basically, and, and why they're important to our reading. I mean, you could say they're important to organize our reading. Um. But in terms of you know whether you get more or less out of something um, based on whether you, you could base it you can talk about expectation I suppose as well if you're expecting something from a book because it said that it's got these elements in it that uh, you know that that your enjoyment may be more or less based on how much it matches to your expectation so um, I'm, I'm just gonna throw in a question from uh, Google Plus at this point because I think it goes in pretty well right now Sean asks where does the line fall between supernatural thriller and urban fantasy with thriller elements? Um, which is an interesting question to me because I feel that, I mean, that, that sort of establishes a spectrum on which one could place your books, I think. Um, I mean, I, I definitely felt that when I, the, the order in which I read your books was um, more or less the order in which they were stacked in the box I got them. So I read uh, Melinda's adaptation first and briefly thought that they were all going to be YA as a consequence uh, and then was really startled when I read when I started reading Michael's book and realized oh no wait no they're not right we're talking thrillers not YA thrillers we're talking just thriller in general general um, and then um, and uh, Jay's book at Dirty Magic I also like I actually had sort of more of a a, a ready-made box to tick when I um, when I started reading it because I thought oh this is Sort of like cops and magic, so it's kind of probably probably going to be a little bit like Kim Harrison maybe and the Dead Witch Walking series, which I really love. And so I sort of had the only book that I read with any kind of expectation of what I was going to get going into it was Jay's. Um, so, anyways, just to, to throw this back to you, then, do you think there where does that line fall between supernatural thriller and urban fantasy with thriller elements, Jay? Um. You know, I love questions like this uh, because the answer really is that it's about marketing. Um, writers do not sit down and say, am I going to write an urban fantasy with, you know, with thriller elements or am I going to write a supernatural thriller? We don't have that discussion with ourselves. That's done later um, by the people who buy the books um, or the people who sell the books in bookstores when they decide where to place it. Um, when we're talking about blending genres, what we're talking about is a book's going to have its own Venn diagram, right? And every book, you know, like urban fantasy, for example, 
uh, is really hard to define because it's not a traditional genre like um, romance or mystery or thrillers. Um, it's it's a blend. It's by its very nature a blending of genres. So each book has its own combination of things in it, and so you can't say that they're all, you know, paranormal romance with thriller. They aren't. Some are very noir with no romance, uh, but a lot of world building. So. Um, it really just there there isn't a, a definition we just are not comfortable um, people are not comfortable with any kind of ambiguity we want to put things into boxes um, and I understand the reasoning for that and I understand the reason we want it for marketing but as an author um, the only time I would be worried about that is if I was trying to write a straight genre and felt like I needed to stay within the confines otherwise I feel like those rules don't apply. Um, I might. Melinda? Yeah. Uh, well, I think Jay nailed it. Um, I, I, I totally agree. I think that that distinction is clearly a marketing distinction. And I know that you can get certain people in when you call it a supernatural thriller that you won't get if you say it's urban fantasy. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's OK. I think there are many ways to pitch any one book. I think the problem is if you start to then, it, it, you cannot ever on, only pitch a book one way. I, I think that books have different readers who come to it for, for different reasons. And I think that as a book comes out and you're trying to get it out there, it's really important to reach out to all those segments, especially if it is a genre bending book. And I think that um, that might make it a little bit more difficult sometimes uh, in terms of marketing, but at the same time it gives it a really broad reach. So, you know, it's like one step forward, two steps back, or it's, it's, always, it's always a challenge to get the books into the hands of the right uh, readers, the people who want to read the book. But I, I definitely think it's a marketing question, for sure. Actually, I'm just going to jump back in for a second, because um, I Briefly, because I think Michael Michael is trying to fix something on his end. Is it fixed? I'm, I'm I don't know. I, I I'm not. Am I muted? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, head. actually, it oh, may it's actually just be coming from my head, in which case there's nothing I can do about it. <laughs> no, no, it's perfect. This is this is bliss. Actually, the the static is completely gone. Um, but I'm still going to keep you paused for a second, only because oh. um, uh, somewhere between Jay and Melinda, it, something occurred to me, and I wanted to ask you about this as well. Um, do you feel then, like, just to kind of follow up on this question? Do you think that there is actually um, a sort of gendered distinction between supernatural thriller on the one hand and urban fantasy on the other hand? Um, and I ask this because I—it's only like literally just occurred to me as you're saying it. No, wait. Yeah, when I hear supernatural thriller, I sort of assume uh, something that's kind of got you know Navy SEALs and uh, you know military stuff with genre, and it's it's sort of dudes, big dudes, rah. And then if I hear urban fantasy, then I immediately have that sort of now iconic cover image in my head of a woman sort of half posed away from you with a tattoo and some kind of weapon. And <laughs> my eye just started operas. twitching. Right? No. So I mean, obviously, marketing works because this this is how it happened in my brain. And so I think maybe we could interrogate that slightly. Do you think that like there is a gendered element to this distinction? Um, and like, could that maybe feed into your answer, Michael, to um, like where that line falls between supernatural? Uh, and urban I don't know. I mean, I, I I would think of someone I guess like China Mieville as an urban fantasy writer, and he 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 immediately sort of slightly balks that, to be honest. Um, I'm afraid I'm going to say the same thing again, which is I don't know what the difference between supernatural. I don't know what the difference between those two things are, and I think Jay's absolutely right. I think. I think it's it's almost a given that anybody who sits down and says, right, I'm now going to write brackets fill in title of genre will probably write something quite dull. Mm -hmm. um, it may well be that later in the process someone from marketing or someone from sales will say we quite like this but we're not sure what box we're going to put it in therefore we'll give it a box or you may in the second draft say okay this is all very well I've written a great big book but I need to be mindful of the next part of the process I, ought to, uh, I need to find a way of reaching out directly to some sub subdivision of, of readers and then you might start to, to shape the stone into into a particularly recognizable genre but it's just it's not, not only is it not what I do I sort of fight against it in some ways really with a degree of sort of career perverseness for which you know I, I wish I didn't but that's what it is and so 
how to make a distinction between an urban fantasy and a fantastic urban novel, all these things, I just, I, I think actually these are, these are meta questions and publishing questions that I just, I don't have an answer to. Well, I, to, to follow up on that, actually, I'm, I'm, this is something I was really curious to ask you about, because in We Are Here, uh, you have two writers. You have, um, you have David on the one hand and Talia on the other hand. And David, at the beginning at any rate, it seems like David is writing uh, a book that seems to be a kind of, you know, understated kind of literary sort of thing. You know, it's, it's, it's definitely broadcast as being a certain kind of book. And Talia, on the other hand, is writing a very out there secondary world fantasy novel. And I was really, really interested by the fact that you had two writers in a book. Uh, you, you often find a book with our, a writer in it, but the fact that you had two, two who are writing in really different genres and two who are kind of relating to each other um, through the uh, the fact that they were both aspiring writers was interesting to me. And I was wondering, like, do you, did you mean to, because I, I was reading this inflection into it, but did you mean to kind of inflect that relationship with, you know, this background noise of, of marketing categories and things like that? or for that matter, with the kind of gender distinction of a woman writing fantasy, a man writing a kind of, you know, understated literary aspiration kind of novel? Um, not really, no. Um, I, I, I'm sure there are gender differences in these things, but uh, it's not something that, again, that I'm, I'm sort of particularly aware of. I mean, I think I, I put those two those two characters in. I mean, I think it's an important thing when you get a writer for a certain amount of time. You do tend to write about what you know and what you know about most of the writing. So that's probably why those two characters end up doing that. But I think also it's it's interesting the degree to which you know I could I could sit down and write a, a literary novel. Um, sorry, you're splitting my static in that. A little bit, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and all you need to do is change one small thing. If you've got a very literary novel. In which suddenly someone has a tiny degree of recognition or something, and suddenly that changes it. Or you could say, actually, in real life, a lot of people feel that they have some sort of recognition. There's loads of people who think that they know that when the thing's going to ring, it's like the third day. There's loads of people who have superstitions, um, and they don't believe that this necessarily means that they're buying into some kind of ma massive supernatural view of the world. I think. You can open the doors of what is what is accepted to be natural and normal without necessarily saying you believe in the whole shebang. And I think I guess that's what I'm that's what I'm most interested in doing. I'm saying instead of an incredible reductionist look at the world, let's look at what people actually believe. Um, let's look at how people sort of experience the world themselves, and let's still try and keep that view. Um, so I'm getting a lot of notes saying. Well, oh, sorry. Uh, very static, so I'll be quiet for a bit. Oh, it's alright. <laughs> Oh, well, I, um, I'm just going to say one more thing about that, because, uh, and hopefully it won't be saying things that you just said that I couldn't hear under the static. Um, I, I just, uh, from what you were saying, you know, the, the way that those two writers in the book approached their novels was very interesting to me, uh, because you had, I mean, here you basically had two writers who you establish in the book are writing two very outright different styles of, of different genres, absolutely, but the ways in which they that you demonstrate them thinking about their writing is very very similar and the the fact that they're you know while Talia is writing this you know out there fantasy called what was it allegoria or allegria or something um, she's obviously drawing on her own experience in in the way that uh, David is and later on you know we I won't spoil anything anyways but uh, but the fact that they're, you see them both working as writers in different ways, but drawing on, but with very, like similarities that are very of the marrow. So I, I kind of appreciate that within the discussion of genre markers and things. Um, yeah, well, I think I think the thing is that most most writers are basically doing the same job. They're, they're sitting in an empty room with or without a cat, trying to make stuff up. <laughs> and ultimately, sooner or later, somebody will put a certain type of jacket on it and they'll put it on a certain type of shelf. But really, the experience of writing is very similar. Yeah, exactly. All right, well, having talked uh, quite a bit about the thriller side of things, um, I'd like to talk a bit more about the genre uh, stuff, the, the specifically the science fiction fantasy stuff. So um, one thing that I'd like to address is the fact that you've got in both um, Melinda and in uh, Michael's books, you've got other presences kind of living among the stuff and stuff hidden. Um, and uh, and I was wondering if there's, I mean, actually, arguably, in, Jay, uh, in Jay's book as well, 
you could say this, um, extend that to drug uses in general and um, their kind of usual invisibility and, you know, the times at which they become visible are usually very traumatic or so on. Uh, so to all of you then, um, is there something about this idea of hidden presences among us that is of particular interest to you or why in particular uh, did it take this form in, in your books? What was the kind of genesis of that for each of you? I'll let one of them go first because it I think it applies more to their books. <laughs> I'll, I'll go. Um, I, I'll go first. So for me, um, the idea for adaptation came to me in a dream. <laughs> it's a, it's really um, it sounds very stereotypical to say it. It's the only time it has ever happened to me, and I I don't anticipate it ever happening again. But um, in my my dream was very clear. So. Um, when I had it, I went and wrote down the inspiration, which um, was, uh, in my dream, I was stuck in the Dallas airport, and these birds started crashing into airplanes. So uh, the, the premise of the dream, um, and the thing that intrigued me was, um, why are these birds crashing into airplanes and making the planes crash? I think that um, I was very clearly influenced by the X-Files which is a show that I was a huge fan of uh, back in the, in the 90s and its heyday. I actually uh, was in graduate school for a while and I studied X-Files fandom. So I, I knew a lot of the ins and outs of um, X-Files-ness and I, I'm, um, I'm sure that that is where those other presences came from <laughs> in my book. So if you've, if you've seen the X-Files, you can pretty much clearly guess what those other presences are. <laughs> and... Uh, yeah, so that's where they came from. I, I think that for me also, before I wrote these books, I wrote two fantasy novels that were, um, one uh, was a fairy tale retelling, and the other was a more traditional high fantasy kind of thing, and they both involved fairies. And I remember reading in some of my research, the interesting thing about fairies is that they have all these um, aspects to them. You know, people, when they would see fairies, there would be lights in the distance. They They would be taken by fairies, they would have experience missing time, you know, and uh, they would be taken to other underworld realms and come back a changed person. A lot of these mythologies translate almost directly to our contemporary beliefs about aliens, which I find really fascinating. So I think in my books you can definitely see a connection between these um, otherworldly creatures, even though they come from totally opposite ends of the fantasy science fiction spectrum. Mm -hmm. Michael? Yeah, I'll go. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think for me that probably operates on two levels. I think there's a huge fascin fascination, and you know, may relate to what Melinda was talking about of of the idea of the other, of uncanny pre um, presences in the background of our lives, and um, uh, it's something that's something that I've specifically explored over time, um, and you know, things like. You know, for a long time, we weren't the only humanoid species who were living on this planet. Do, is there some sort of back echo of having coexisted with, with similar creatures that might inform our view of otherness outside us? But I think, in a way, for me, there's, there's another level which is almost more interesting, which is that we are constantly dealing with, with hidden presences in our lives in a very non-supernatural way. Mm -hmm. During the course of this conversation, I'm speaking, but I've also got voices going on in the back of my head saying, "What the hell is this static problem about? <laughs> How can I fix it?" Also, am I sounding intelligent, or is it, or is this just nonsense? There is also memories that, that I'm processing at the same time. Um, whatever we do on any given day is structured by what happened to us ten years ago, five years ago, twenty years ago. Those, those inner presences of previous selves by what our friends think, by what relationship we're in, by what's going through our head in any given moment. All of these hidden presences are informing every moment of our life. And I think that's part of what it is to be human. And maybe sometimes what we're doing is externalizing these and manifesting these so that we can have a dialogue with them and say, okay, these are the strange things that happen within human consciousness, within the human condition. Let's find a way of detaching them so that we can look at them a little bit more Clearly, and I think that's one of the great, great freedoms that our genres have. In very realistic fiction, you can't really do that, which is why you end up with endless amounts of internal dialogue because that's the only way of sort of confronting these questions. Whereas we can say, actually, no, we're you know what, we're going to get metaphorical on this. We're going to yank these things apart and see what happens if we put them in direct conflict in front of us. And I think that can produce very, very interesting stuff. Absolutely. Um, I was really intrigued 
in your novel specifically, uh, wait, am I muted? Sorry, this is going to be the eternal question. Am I muted? Or no, not? you're not. <laughs> I'm fine. Um, so, uh, so Michael, you've mentioned in, in a number of interviews that um, that you're really interested in exploring the idea of friendship in in We Are Here, um, and the the thing that you that you're just talking about in terms of memories, in terms of um, these voices and so on, things that that kind of inform us that we have to confront. Um, the do you it's sort of I, I had this one specific question for you about the way that you have friendship in the novel. I I this could just be me, but my sense was that friendship was an almost sinister kind of presence. In it, that it was. Um, Thinking I, about your friends, mine are mainly quite nice, but yeah. I know exactly. <laughs> I was I was quite surprised. Um, the thing is that I I'm always genuinely delighted to see to, to read novels in which friendship is valorized. I think that it is, um, and I think you've noted this as well. Um, it's often it often plays second string to romances. Um, mm. It's often um, it's often just kind of underwritten or it's something in the background. It's not usually the meat of a novel. Mm -hmm. And to see it be the meat of a novel is always tremendously exciting to me. Um, but in in We Are Here specifically, I felt that you were exploring a range of possible ways that friendship could be. You've, there are destructive friendships. There are friendships that are um, that that one party wants to continue while another party is trying to evade. Uh, and the it, it's sort of, and this to me flew in the face of truisms about friendship as something that is just kind of nice and background and nurturing and so on. Um, instead, like and I'd just like you to comment on the things that I'm saying. Basically, you can just say yeah, no. Yeah, sure. No, no I, I think that's true because I mean, I think <clears throat> I do think that, that that you know a lot of our popular culture, be it songs, movies, books, and so on, is all about love. Love is the big story, and actually, we spend a certain amount of time being in love and having love in the background of your life is a, is a marvelous thing. But friendships tend to be the thing that that basically friendships are like the manifestation of of, of society or cultural structure. That's what you live within, mm -hmm. um, and. So they are extremely important on a day-to-day -day basis, both the ones you have now and the ones you have in the past, because those influences will have helped define you, that have helped create you. Some of them will be positive, some of them will be bland, some of them will be extremely negative. Um, and I think they're also important because they're, 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 they speak to things like, I mean, there's the, the, the French writer Marc Roger has a, has a great theory of memory where he basically says things happen and then your memory of the event gets eroded by time, almost like a sort of the shape of a coastline. And basically, as time goes, things will be chipped out, and the hard bits, certain bits, will be left. Um, and I think that can also happen with friendships. And I think over the course of time, if you chart back what has turned you into the geographic feature that you are now, it is very often the the erosions caused by certain types of friendships, or the accretions caused by certain types of friendships that 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 have a, often a far more important role in making you who you are or making you short of what you would wish to be than necessarily particular relationships of love. And so, yeah, there was a particular interest to in me in this book to say, yes, love, we get it. It's important. But what about all this other stuff? Because that actually takes up 95% of our time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think that um, actually in both uh, Melinda and Jay's books as well, I was really heartened to see uh, that there were also really strong friendships that were going on in your protagonists' lives, um, that you have, uh, that, that they are, and that they're more than just kind of a background, they are actually people who are there to sort of hash out the, the many very strange problems that are taking place. Um, and so Melinda, I wanted to come to you in this actually, because uh, I'm so I was another thing that I was really excited about in your novel is that your protagonist starts to explore um, a, a same-sex romance that grows out of a friendship that grows out of a kind of in, in a really sort of intense way, um, and I was particularly interested in that because I think that for a lot of young girls, kind of exploring their sexuality it comes out that way as well. It comes out in terms of like you, you start by having these really close female friends, um, and then that sort of starts to blur the lines between where sexual desire is and where you know. Um, passionate friendship is, for instance. So uh, would you want to kind of comment a bit on that and how it plays into adaptation? Sure. Um, that's interesting that you think the same-sex romance comes out of friendship. I I definitely would not have said that. I, I would have said that the... the uh, there, there, there are two uh, romantic 
strains in adaptation and the sequel inheritance, and I would say the heterosexual one certainly comes out of friendship. Um, the the lesbian one, I um, I'm I'm totally just floored by your observation. So uh, Sorry, what, I'll, I'll, let me let me clarify. Kind of, uh, let me say I, what I yeah. mean is that for for your protagonist. It's that she starts out, you know, thinking like it's it's very brief. It happens very quickly. Um, I just mean that she sees, she doesn't see it coming. She hasn't already formed right. an identity of herself as bisexual. She's like she's um, so she herself is floored by it, and it starts out for. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Is that she starts out for her under that veneer of friendship, um, under a kind of like, well, you know, our, sh sure, I'm going over to her place, and oh wait, no, now we're kissing. You know, it's like so. To me, there was an element of a permissibility to it that was allowed by the sense that, okay, we're being friends. It's not like they met at, you know, that, that it wasn't established for her that she was looking right. for, or that's what I meant. Right. Yeah. No, I, I totally, I totally see that. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, what should I say about it? Um, you can actually you can forget that and flip it around to like the, <laughs> the fact that you know her friendship with her other character the other characters in the novel for that matter I love her friendship with her gay best her friend, friend Julian asking me yeah his name is Julian yeah I I loved I loved writing that too I thought it was really fun it just seemed to me that she was experiencing all this drama for not only romantic drama that was but you know thriller drama and it seemed you know. If I was her, I would want to talk about it with my friend. <laughs> and it's just, it's a, it's, it's, the thing is, um, I am very drawn to writing um, romantic storylines about um, two girls, I think, because I just don't see that very much. I'm still writing stories that I want to read, and so I, I'm telling these um, lesbian love stories often. And at the sa same time, I want the characters to have a broader world the problem is, if you're writing a book, the more characters you put in, the more friends you have, the longer the book gets, and the more you have to develop those side characters and give them something of their own, because you don't want to just have like a two-dimensional person on the side that your main character uses to spill their guts to, so you can, you know, have some info dumping. Like there has to be like a complicated a backstory for each each supporting character. So I think that as I write more books, I'm becoming increasingly aware of how complicated this is mm -hmm. in uh, making those friendships as uh, fully fleshed out as they can be, even as secondary plot lines. Mm -hmm. So I probably went off in a different direction, but <laughs> no, that's totally fine. And can I just say on the subject of um, <laughs> of getting better at this and so on, I was amazed by the um, the fact that. This is not a spoiler. That that adaptation ends as a press conference is about to begin, such that your next book can begin launching all this exposition <laughs> in a press conference. I just thought that was genius. I thought, what? And like, I, at the end of the book, was reading the first chapter, the next, going, this is so seamless. I'm just so impressed. Oh well, thank you. <laughs> I I did think of it as one big story that I had to cut in half, and maybe, it was, maybe I was cheating a little by starting it with a press conference, but you know, it, it was going to happen, so I, I I went with it. <laughs> so um, uh, so Jay, did you want to add anything about about friendship? And actually, um, it's been suggested to me to to kind of open this up and say, do you guys have any recommendations as well about um novels in which you see friendship uh, valorized and, and or your favorite books that are kind of about friendship and stuff? Uh, well, I'll, first I'll, I'll comment about the use of friendship in Dirty Magic. Um, one of the things that I, because it's a series with a single protagonist, um, it was important to me to have uh, relationships that were evolving um, and progressing through the story uh, and not just have it be about um, the crimes that she was solving. I wanted to tell a story about this character um, and watch her grow. Um, so she has uh, she has a little brother that she's raising. Um, she has a next door neighbor who's kind of this crazy witch um, who adds some humor to it, but also is kind of a uh, maternal figure for Kate. Um, she has a best friend named Penn who uh, uh, is a part of her life and also helps her raise Danny. And is um, conveniently a therapist as well. 
she's a therapist, which is <laughs> leads to lots of interesting discussions. Um, and then, of course, she's starting uh, at the beginning of the story. She joins this new task force with the Magic Enforcement Agency, and so it's about the relationships with her partner, uh, Drew Morales, and all the members of the team. And and so um, what it allows you to do when you have all these side characters is you can use subplots to help support the theme of the main story. Um, so it's really great to, uh, when I sit down to write these books, I'm like, okay, I know what's going on with Kate. I know what the crime is. What's happening with all these other people? And how does it tie into what's happening with the case? And so it's a challenge, but it's also a great way to kind of explore other angles of the themes because each book in this series is based on a different alchemical process. So there's a, a very strong thematic language that's happening in each book. Um, of course, alchemy is not just a pseudoscience. It's also a metaphor for self-individuation. Uh, you know, Jung studied it extensively. So my hope is that by following the processes of alchemy through the series, we're watching Kate's growth as she becomes, you know, more evolved and balanced as a person. So we're also seeing uh, her friends and family go through that process as well. So that is so cool. Can I just ask out of curiosity? Is is um, antimony and the process of purification this the, the through thread in this book? Uh, antimony is part of the first process of alchemy, and um, so uh, you know I've studied everything. You know, so I've had I kind of gave myself this interesting challenge because I also had I had to understand alchemy as a, mm -hmm. kind of a science and be able to speak about it in the books um, but I also had to study these kind of very lengthy texts by Jung and his acolytes about the psychological implications and things which I kind of geek out about but um, you know it's all symbolic and so I can yeah. use that in the stories a lot so it's fun. Yeah, that's excellent. Um, that actually leads to uh, pretty neatly to a Twitter question. Um, someone asks, uh, in the world of your books, is magic hidden or does it have a structure in our world, like, for instance, Jay's Magical en uh, Enforcement Agency? Um, so do you, Melinda and Michael, do you want to answer that question just for each of your books? Well, there is no magic in um, adaptation. I think um, there is certainly some hidden structure um, there are certainly some conspiracy elements. Uh, I think that I cannot say anything more about them. <laughs> right, um, course, that's true. There's, there's so many spoilers on it. I would have said, for instance, that um, you know, a certain thing that has to do with the title might possibly be able to be read as magic and in, in the effect that it has. But obviously, it, that's paradigmatic, so it doesn't just want you to be. Um, anyway, no, it's so hard, because I really want to discuss like every aspect of these books without actually giving anything away. Adaptation, by the way, is super excellent. All of these books are super excellent. I'm just going to say that to anyone who's watching. <laughs> just go read them, so that then we can have like meteor discussions about them. Um, Michael, do you want to talk actually about the... I, it's difficult with yours as well, actually, because it's all sort of mysterious, but do you want to talk at all about um, any kind of, uh, you know, structure that uh, that the, the hidden element and how can I even phrase this question no I feel like I should just answer it for each of you um, no there isn't a, anyway no Michael do you want to talk about the structure that the um, the gathered have in your book just amongst themselves actually the fact that they've there are cornermen fingermen journeymen um, no um, because I think I think <laughs> that's one of those things that I, th I think struck it would were to discuss that now that would be a problem for someone who was coming to the reader for the first time but I think I and mean, I think in all these books and in, in a lot of books um, what is often very interesting is the idea of unpacking a sort of hidden structure about the world I mean I, I think we all to a greater or lesser degree have a sort of belief in some sort of Gnostics thing behind something happening behind the veil, some sort of conspiracy, something going on that we don't know about. And again, often I think that's a manifestation of, of qualms that we may have about our own selves, that we realize that a lot of what we do and a lot of what we feel is driven by inner processes that we're not in particularly good control over, that we may not particularly understand. And it may just it may just be me, but I think there's a, there's often a strong feeling of sort of dualism that there's the me who does stuff and says stuff, and then there's some other presence that informs all of that, and often does so in a rather subversive, unknown, inchoate manner. And 
<clears throat> I think a lot of the stuff that, that, that tends to get dealt with in, in the type of fiction that we write is often, again, a, a way of manifesting and externalizing this understanding that we are not core, we are not single intelligences placed inside the world. We are not, everything is a lot more complicated than it looks. Mm -hmm. And that uneasy awareness that of, of, of uncanny other, other levels in our lives is what a lot of our fiction tends to get at. And you can either deal with that directly, you can deal with it metaphorically, it's. I mean, that's that's the fun. That's the game, and that's where you get into genre blending through saying, okay, this is the kind of thing I want to say. These are the bits that are conventionally associated with other genre that I'm going to choose to help me manifest this story. It is occurring to me as you as you're talking that uh, really Jay's book, which foregrounds a magical structure and has it be, you know, a, a functional. Um, and and explicit part of the world has a mystery that is uh, I don't want to use the word mundane because it's not to diminish it but it's just saying that the mystery is actually one that you'd find in procedurals um, it is one to do with people and the things that they do as opposed to with hidden presence or or any kind of you know <clears throat> magic being explained or anything like that whereas um, in in Melinda and Michael's books. I'm trying to answer this Twitter question as best I can. <laughs> um, in Melinda and Michael's books, the um, any kind of the 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 numinous in each of those books is actually part of the thriller mystery. And so, where the the world seems mundane and and foregrounded, the thriller aspect of it is not so much the plot as it is the revelation of the mystery. Would that be accurate for for you guys? And hopefully, if I if I can just yeah. add a little bit, um, yeah. I made a conscious decision. Um, because the there was the world building was complex mm -hmm. that I knew that the mystery needed to be easier to follow um, because I was throwing a lot of new things at the reader to to follow as far as you know the structure of the covens and you know this alternate reality where you know magic is a major commodity and things like that that I felt like okay well. So the the crimes that they're solving need to be more straightforward, procedural, and okay. relatable. Um, there is magic involved, but they don't use magic to solve the crime. Can I just say, it, it, one thing I absolutely love about all of your books is the fact that you are also very genre aware in ways that you have, that I, I just see kind of little jokes happening about in the books. Like the fact Jay has literally a place that is on Exposition Boulevard. Like it, she, you know, it's just it was so amazing to me. I, like, I should have marked We've all been there. Because there's, there's a place called the Green Fairy, and someone says, "Oh yeah, the Absinthe Bar on Exposition Boulevard." And I was like, "Did that just happen? Did this, <laughs> this is so great." Um, and it happens early on. And so, but I just I loved that. I love that you guys were clearly and and I mean I could say it for for Melinda and for Michael as well. For Michael, again, I could be totally wrong about this, but to me, the fact that you had writers writing in different genres in the book spoke a lot to kind of being aware of these Oh no, anything that makes me sound smart is definitely true. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Melinda, yours has a lot to do with conspiracy theories and there's a lot of kind of poking fun at some of the more outré uh, conspiracy theories <laughs> and stuff like that. So I just, I think that that's actually part of that blending as well, that you take this awareness of these markers and kind of weave them in in a sort of tongue-in-cheek way, which I think is, is really fantastic. Um, last thing I'd like to kind of talk about in the time that we've got before turning to any other questions uh, that people may have, um, I'd like to talk about your research methods for, for each of, for each of your, your books. Um, because I, I absolutely, I was blown away by the research that Jay did, or revealed that she, she did for uh, Dirty Magic. But um, I also really, I mean, in both, um, in, in Michael's book, I was sort of staggered by the presence of New York City as almost a character in the book. Um, I just, I really felt that like every time someone turned a corner or went somewhere, I was like, New York was being built in my head, um, which I've never been to, so I really appreciated that. Um, and, uh, and Melinda, I'm really curious to know, you know, um, what kind of research you did into conspiracy theories, into things like around Area 51 and stuff like that, um, and to what degree, you know, how did you go about doing this for each of your books, basically? Um, I may as well start with Jay, just because the, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> um, I really had to, to research two different things. Uh, one was I had to learn how to write cops convincingly.
And the other thing was I had to learn how to write about al alchemy and related magical traditions, um, which uh, is a little, writing about alchemy is a little different than writing about uh, a made up magic because there's this very long historical tradition. Um, as for the cop thing, um, I, a little bit of background, my mother was actually a reserve officer and my father as well. He was a fireman and had to go to the reserve training to arrest um, people as the fire marshal. And then my mother uh, was like, well, you're never home, so I'm just going to become a cop too so we can hang out together. Um, <laughs> She was a bookseller by day and a cop at night, which is how you end up with me. Um, but um, so kind that of kind of cool blending in and of itself, yeah. isn't it? Yes, Sorry. exactly. Um, so that kind of sparked the interest, I think, in writing about a female officer. Um, but I went and took uh, there's a citizens police academy in my town. It's like a 16 week program, 12 or 16 weeks, I can't remember. Um, where you go and learn about all the different things. It's very hands-on. You get to drive cop cars at full speed through obstacle courses and go on ride-alongs and, you know, handle drugs um, and, well, not, not handle them, but, you know, <laughs> they're sealed um, and, and those types of things. So it was really, really fun. And then I also did the Riders Police Academy, which is uh, it's hosted in North Carolina. Uh, there's this wonderful writer who's a former cop named Lee Laughlin who runs it. Um, and he brings in DEA, ATF, all the acronyms, um, and you go through a boot camp learning how to write COPS. Um, so that's the COP research, and then the uh, alchemy thing, I mean, it was a lot of reading. It was reading everything from Alchemy for Dummies, which is literally where I had to start, <laughs> um, uh, through, you know, kind of more... Uh, texts like Edward Edinger's um, Anatomy of the Psyche, uh, which is about the Jungian approach to alchemy and things like that. So, uh, But I really geek out about research. It's a great way for me to kind of stretch myself personally. I mean, I never would have done a ride-along with a cop for eight hours. Um, it would have terrified me if it wasn't for a book. So it's a great way to kind of push my own boundaries, and then I get to put it in my stories. So That is so amazing. <laughs> that is really fun. Um, Melinda? Well, I'm going to have to go to this Writer's Police Academy thing. I'm going to sure. write that down. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I normally would not tell people to do their research on Wikipedia, but <laughs> if you are researching crazy conspiracy theories, Wikipedia is the, way, is the place to start. I mean, it totally is, because um, people who um, believe in these things, and there are many, many of them, I think, I mean, there's a lot of people who believe this stuff. They 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 um, are online a lot, so there are, there's like a rabbit hole you can go down in terms of conspiracy theory online, and you go into this like world where people talk about things that rationally I know cannot be true, but the environment of the online discussion is such that it totally feels like you have entered a parallel dimension in which everything you did not think was true is real. It's a little bit insane. Um, but I also read, you know, nonfiction that was published by publishers and was researched. Um, like Annie Jacobson, she just has a book right now about the paperclip, Operation Paperclip, which is a, uh, which was when the U.S. government brought in German scientists to design things for us <laughs> in the 50s. She did a, a huge book called Area 51, came out uh, while I was researching adaptation. It's really military history. It was it's a big book. It's it's very fascinating. That, that's where I got all my Area 51 stuff, <laughs> I gotta say. Um, yeah, and I also did a lot of research, weirdly, on um, brain science and consciousness. Mm. So I, I, find that, I found that super interesting. I, I don't have a biology background, but I, um, I read a lot of scientific papers about consciousness, <laughs> which I am now completely fascinated by and will probably continue to read that stuff in the future. So that's where some of my research was. Thank you. Michael? Uh, yeah, I'm kind of a lazy researcher, really. I tend to just make, make most of it up. Um, and <laughs> when I do it, it tends to be, I guess, basically geographic, and it tends to come in two stages. I um, because I, I do I do find the Lacars to be very very important characters in my books. Um, they they you know, they inform what's happened. I I would prefer it if if the the story of any particular book could not have happened anywhere apart from that place. 
and I've certainly found that that's happened a couple of times in the past um, <clears throat> with We Are Here and with a book of mine called The Intruders, which is one that's being shot for TV at the moment. Both of them had a very similar um, process in that I happened to, with The Intruders, I happened to go to Seattle for a few days and started to have some ideas that were coming out of the back of that. Similarly, I'd had the idea for We Are Here for quite some time, but I hadn't really found a way of, of, of getting it out. And then I happened to spend some time in New York for a little while, and, I, and it, it started to accrete around that place. And so I tend to find <clears throat> that an idea will come out of a place, and what I'll then do is go back and and lock myself onto it. And, then the, and it, as I say, my, my research tends to be geographic, really. I will, I will go and spend a week in a place leave the hotel at 9 o'clock in the morning and then walk for eight hours without stopping um, round and round and about and about and just trying to get inside the place, trying, trying to get a feel of it. Because it's very easy to sort of, you know, just just Google Street Map it or, or, or read a guidebook and very often you'll get, what you'll get is exteriors there and you want to you want to be on the streets at all time of day, all times of night and just gradually let, and I think cities in particular can do this to you. You enter a sort of contract with them and they seep into you and then gradually you get to know them in the same way that you would get to know a person. You can't, you know, you can't get to know a person through reading their, you know, their Twitter bio and, and reading a couple of tweets. You've actually got to go spend a week dealing with them. When they've got hangovers, when they're in a good mood, when they're in a bad mood and just basically start to get to know them. So. I think just about all the research that I do tends to have that rapid nature to it, and the rest of it is just made up. Sorry. That is that is really really fascinating, and I think it it absolutely comes through, and we are here. It uh, it Good. really does. It, it, it I mean I, I won't go I won't belabor that point. It just absolutely successful. I'm really glad to hear that because it's I mean, New York is a town I don't know super well, but I had, I did try to get inside it a little bit. Yeah, the sense of its neighborhoods especially really came through. So I'm just going to come to, uh, we've got one last question um, from Google, from Clara. Uh, she says, I'm a big fan of Melinda's efforts at promoting diversity in YA. How important do you think it is for authors to make diversity explicit in their works and to make it obvious when characters are non-white or straight or cisgendered, et cetera, et cetera or when they're not white, not straight, not cisgendered, et cetera, rather? Um, so I'll just say that to all of you, whoever wants to jump in. Um, I'll just go since um, I'm very glad that they're um, happy with uh, Diversity in YA. It's, it's really a passion project for me and my uh, friend Cindy Pond. I, I've been asked this question before at writers conferences where someone will say I have a character and he is of uh, mixed race or he's not white but um, do I need to explain that in the book like um, explicitly and I, I always say Yes, yes, you need to explain that in the book. You need to state it openly because in the United States and probably also in uh, uh, many other English language speaking uh, countries, Canada, UK, Australia, we tend to default to a norm, quote unquote norm, which is um, white, straight, and um, able-bodied. So if the character does not fit those uh, external signifiers, absolutely you need to explain it. And uh, it can be very hard to do because, as people may remember from The Hunger Games, um, there was that character, Rue, who is black in the book. And when people went to see the movies, uh, many of them were shocked that she was played by a black actress and reacted with uh, a lot of racism. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really, that was really uh, difficult to see and very disappointing. I, I think it just shows that even if you explain it in the book, some people are not going to get it. But that doesn't mean you can give up on explaining it. Um, I think obviously diversity is important um, in fiction and in you know real life. Um, I uh, I actually ran into something. Uh, I read a review of Dirty Magic where um, somebody said something about uh, Kate's best friend Pen, and I realized that the reason they misunderstood her was that I didn't explicitly state that she was African American. Um, I didn't do, I didn't think about it because uh, Kate knew she was black um, and Kate didn't see her that way so I just, it just didn't come up. I think there was maybe one line of dialogue she said that might have hinted that way. Mm -hmm. um, and I realized now that I made a mistake because everybody, like Melinda says, defaults to um, someone being white. Um, so I, I think it is important to make it clear um, and I think um, it can be tricky, especially when you are a, a white uh, CIS able-bodied person um, because people 
uh, will often think that you get it wrong, but I don't think that that means you shouldn't try. Uh, I think it's better to default to trying and getting it wrong than to not try at all um, because you're afraid. Um, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know what else to say about it. I think diversity is important, and we should all be striving to make our books look more like the real world. I will say, Jay, I, I totally got that Penn was black. <laughs> I, uh, like, and, but I don't know how much of that is the fact that these conversations happen. And it's, it, I have noticed in myself now that sometimes I, I actually bring extra scrutiny to the books to see, like, wait, how, has there been a black character yet? Because, you know, if not, why not? Especially, you know, so anyways, I, I, I did get that. So um, thank you for that. Anyways, it was, it was really cool. And I really love that character. Okay. Uh, Michael? Um, yeah, I mean, this is not something I've got particularly strong views on, to be honest. I mean, I, I yes, of course, uh, there is huge diversity in the world, and that if if our books are going to be honest, then they need to reflect that. Um, I tend to think it's a bit like sex scenes, really. I mean, I, I on one level, in that I won't put a sex scene in. I won't, I won't ever, but I haven't yet ever. But who knows? Because <laughs> I find I find it. I never say never. You never know. Um, but. I've not yet read a sex scene which does not, which does one of the two jobs that a scene needs to do, which is to either advance the plot or speak to character. Now, if specifying very tightly the ethnicity, gender, lifestyle, whatever it is of a particular character makes a difference either to their character or to the story, then absolutely it needs to be done and books need to reflect the way the world is. But I think sometimes, because, because readers have certain processes, if you flag up that someone's wearing a red jacket, then they'll assume that the red jacket is going to be important um, when it may not be. And I'm personally in favor of just leaving it as open as possible and so that I don't tightly specify any of these things and I let the readers make their own assumptions about it because I think in that way you're reflecting their own understanding of diversity rather than saying, okay, here we have A, B, C, D, E and feeling that you've ticked a lot of boxes when you've not necessarily added anything to the story and you've not necessarily done anything significant. So. But you know that sounds negative. I just I just don't have any particularly strong axe to grind in either direction, to be honest. All right. I see that. Thank you for that. Um, I see that Ellen has joined us. Uh, so okay. I think that probably means that uh, our time is up. Um, so yes. uh, I'll just I'll just hand it back over to Ellen and say thank you guys so much as well for for answering my questions and, oh, thank, uh, you. and everyone else. thank you, Emma. Yes, thank you, Amal, so much for hosting. Uh, thank you, Jay, Melinda, and Michael for talking about your books, and thank you to everyone at home watching. Uh, we're hoping that we'll be able to do more events like this. We love taking your questions and getting authors, and in this case, a moderator from all across the world, uh, so that you can talk to them. So, yep, thanks, and see you next time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.